Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich, The Way of Life. Being. Notes of Lectures Delivered in Scandinavia, 1904. By J. Boyd. Revised. London, G. Morish, 20, Paternoster Square. 1906. Deliverance, Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 17. My desire is to speak a little on the subject of deliverance. By nature every man is in bondage to sin. The proof of this is that men serve it with every member of their body. Sin is man's master, and pays him wages for his service, and that wages is death. But God has drawn near to men in Christ to deliver from this cruel bondage. We have not apprehended the gospel aright if we have not seen this to be the object of God by it. The first eight chapters of this epistle are for the most part taken up with showing the way in which God has effected this deliverance for man. To a large extent the first three chapters are taken up with proving all under sin. He says in chapter 3 to 9, we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. The proof given as to this in both cases is that they serve it. And from this bondage there is no power in man to effect his deliverance. The Jew was highly favored, God gave him the law, which had he kept he would have lived, but he broke it and came under its curse. It is here a great and true witness against him. It affirms there is none righteous, no, not one, none that seeks after God, none that does good, not so much as one. God has approached man as a savior to deliver him from the service of sin that he may become the servant of God, and that every member of his body may be used in the service of God. That sin may not reign in our mortal body, but that we may be able to present our bodies a living sacrifice to him, and that they may be only used in his service. From the middle of chapter 3 to the end of chapter 8 we get how this is affected. In chapter 3 we have the mercy seed sprinkled with the blood. This is said to be a risen Christ, Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth. He is set forth in the testimony of the gospel, which is to be believed. Redemption is in him, and this redemption involves an entirely new state for man. His blood is the witness that the flesh has received its judgment, and has been made an end of, and by the grace of God we have been justified through this redemption. It is impossible that man can be relieved from the righteous judgment of God under which he lies on account of sin and be left in the old standing in the flesh. At the mercy seat we learn the price that has been paid for our redemption, the blood of Jesus. The redemption is in Christ Jesus, and this can mean nothing less for us than a change of standing, for it is a transfer from one man to another. This may not be all learned at the mercy seat, before we pass on to that which is more advanced, but the truth is there. The righteousness of God has been said to be the assertion of his rights, and it may be spoken of in that way. But it may be simpler to some minds to speak of it as the consistency of God in all his actions with his nature and attributes. The creature needs a standard of obligation set before him, the fulfillment of which is his righteousness, but the only standard with which God must be consistent is himself. In taking the attitude of Saviour towards man he has been consistent with his every attribute and with all that he is in his blessed nature, which is love. So in chapter 3 the righteousness of God is in man's favour, it is to all and upon all them that believe. It is very wonderful that God has been able to assert his rights in a world of sinners, and yet that in the assertion of his rights he has been able to work deliverance for the sinner. If there should break out in this kingdom, Sweden, rebellion against the king it might be impossible for him to assert his rights in favour of his rebellious subjects. The assertion of his rights would most likely mean the destruction of those who had taken up arms against him. But God has come out in Christ to assert his rights and yet save the poor sinner. The mercy seat is where this is learned. In chapter 4 the God of resurrection is before us. Abraham was the heir of the world, all nations of the earth were to be blessed in him. He was to be the father of all them that believed, not only of those amongst the Jews, but of those amongst the Gentiles also. He believed in him who quickens the dead, and calls those things that be not as though they were. This is the God in whom all believe who are of the faith of Jesus. And the way in which he has brought himself before us in this character has been in the resurrection of Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offences and raised again for our justification. Believing in God in this character righteousness is reckoned to us. The effect of being justified on the principle of faith is that we have peace with God, access into favour, and the glory of God is our hope. And in addition to all this, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit. In chapter 6 we come to an entirely different line of things. In chapters 3, 4 and 5 it is more our conduct with respect to that grace. Were we to go to heaven when we were converted we might not need anything more than what we get in chapters 3 to 5. But as a matter of fact we have to pass through this world where sin reigns and where it dominates every child of Adam, and we need deliverance from its power. 
so that instead of being servants of sin we should come out here as under the control of God. In this chapter 6 we are regarded by God as dead to sin. It is the ground we are placed on by baptism, and we are to reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. We get here set before us the path of life. It is the path of life because it is the path of righteousness, in the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway there if there is no death. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 28. Our members that were once used in the service of sin are now to be instruments of righteousness, and we are thus to have our fruit to holiness. And the end everlasting life. But in chapter 7 we see the impossibility of treading the path of righteousness in our own strength, for this we need divine power. The man described in the latter part of chapter 7 is like a man caught in the rapid current of a river and drifting down to destruction without the slightest ability to change his course. He needs power to stem the current that is against him. In chapter 8 we have this power. It lies in the spirit. The apostle says. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The next verse is of the utmost importance to us if we are to understand the deliverance that has been wrought out for us in the grace of God. The law set no object before our souls except indeed our own blessing if we responded to its demands. It was unable to produce in us what it required, but what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, by a sacrifice for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In the judgment of the cross the whole condition of flesh was brought to an end, and God was declared in his great love on our behalf. So that on the one hand we know that our old man has been crucified with him, and that we are no longer in the standing and responsibility of a child of Adam. And on the other hand the love of God has been declared, so that he becomes the controlling object of our hearts, and the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we love God we shall fulfill the first table of the law, and if we love our neighbor as ourselves we shall fulfill the second table, for love is the fulfilling of the law. The law does not reveal the love of God, it tells you to love God, but it does not tell you his love to you. Under law self must be your object, it cannot be otherwise, it is the end you have in view in all your service, it is your own blessing. It is so different under grace, in which you are first blessed by God in his love, and thus set free to serve him without thought of your own blessing. This sets us free from the dominion of sin. We are now able to stem the currents of the world. We have a power within that is greater than sin, and that power is the love of God in our hearts, implanted there by the Holy Spirit. We belong now to another order, we are after the Spirit and we mind the things of the spirit. There are those that are after the flesh, and they mind the things of the flesh, this is the natural order. They know nothing about the things of the spirit, they are not of that order. They that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. This is the spiritual order. We are brought into contact with a new order of things, things that are natural to us as born of the spirit. Our minds are diverted from the lusts and pride of man and are fixed upon the love of God, the excellency of Christ and heavenly things and by the Spirit we mortify the deeds of the body. We are able now to tread the path marked out for us in chapter 6, we are able to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. We are not now self-occupied, but occupied with God. The law occupied us with the sin which it told us we were not to commit, but instead of this helping us it hindered us greatly, for it directed our attention to that to which we were not to live. The Spirit on the other hand occupies us with him to whom we are to live, and in this there is real deliverance. The Spirit is also in us as the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We know that we have a place in association with Christ before the face of God. We have not reached glory yet, we wait for his power to be put forth which shall change our bodies and make them like his own. But before that day arrives we have the Spirit of God's Son in our hearts awaking in us the affections that belong to the place we have in Christ. He also bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God, and makes intercession for us when we do not know what we should ask for. He will also complete the great deliverance for us by quickening our mortal bodies. The spirit dwelling in us is the guarantee that our mortal bodies shall come under the quickening power of God. He who raised up Jesus will do this, and when it is done we shall be placed beyond the reach of sin, death and the power of Satan. What a great gift God has given to us. There is nothing to equal it. Perhaps someone may say, is not Christ as great a gift as that of the Spirit? Yes, but he has not quite given Christ to us, but rather for us. He has given us to Christ, but he has given the Spirit to us. The ground of our deliverance is in the death of Christ, and the power of it is in Christ risen, but the way it is made good in us is in the gift of the Spirit. 
and he gives the spirit to them that ask him. However great the gift of forgiveness may be, it does not quite meet our need. We must have a power in us that is able to set us free from the dominion of sin, and that power is the Spirit of God. And the way in which he operates to set us free from the service of sin is by the knowledge of God. God becomes the great object of our hearts, and in the light of his great love we are glad to put to death the deeds of the body which war against the progress of our souls, and would deprive us of the enjoyment of the light of his face. And as I have already said, his presence in us is the guarantee of complete and final deliverance, for on account of the spirit that dwells in us he will quicken our mortal bodies. What a great gift the spirit is!